So, we're going to get started with our program, and uh, in just a second, I think, is everyone seated? I see Dr. Young, you're here, yes, indeed. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm going to be very brief. This is a great moment for Harvard. It's a great moment for Winthrop House, the house of former President John F. Kennedy. And tonight, we celebrate a special honoree today who just left the president's office. We're going a little longer because our guest of honor has started some educational initiatives that he's invited our president to take part in. And they were, in fact, discussing those educational initiatives that I'm sure he will mention later. So for those of you who came to the reception, we're delighted that you joined the reception, but we were delayed because we were still meeting with President Faust in her office in Massachusetts Hall. I'm Alan Counter, director of the Harvard Foundation and professor of neurology here. And it is my honor to serve as one of your hosts tonight, along with the masters of this house. The masters who've given great leadership in this house, who've been excellent supporters of students, who care a great deal about our students, and we're honored to join them in this special event to celebrate the Humanitarian of the Year. It is my privilege to introduce, to begin this program, the master of this house, Professor Ronald Sullivan, uh, who is a professor at the Harvard Law School. Professor Sullivan. Mr. Secretary General, Mrs. Bond, honored members of the dais, uh, on behalf of co-master Stephanie Robinson, uh, my lovely wife, the, this is a very excited house as you can see. But on behalf of the students in and faculty associated with Winthrop House, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome you to Winthrop House. And as always, it's a distinct honor to uh, host the Peter J. Gomes Humanitarian Award Dinner, uh, sponsored by the Harvard Foundation and Dr. Alan Kauner, uh, who uh, very capably runs the Harvard Foundation. It's always great working with you. Thank you, Alan. As you all know, Winthrop House is one of the 12 undergraduate living learning centers at Harvard College. In fact, Winthrop is the oldest of the houses. We just celebrated our 100th uh, anniversary last year. The model of Winthrop House is particularly fitting for today's events. The model is Space Vincit Thronum. Hope overcomes the throne. Now, in the context of the Harvard housing system, we might say that hope has conquered the status quo. Hope imagined a hundred years ago that one day people of different races, religions, ethnicities, genders, and socioeconomic backgrounds could one day live together and learn together as colleagues. In the context of the United Nations, we might say that in 1942, one cold morning, hope imagined that it could conquer the constructed boundaries that divide us. Hope believed that cross-boundary collaboration could produce international peace and security. Hope believed that geographic differences do not have to predict different levels of social progress. Hope believed that different languages do not have to imply differential living standards. Hope believed that different cultures do not have to experience basic, immutable human rights differently. Hope can blur these orthodoxies. Hope can change our vocabularies. Hope can transform our thinking about those whom we traditionally think of as they into our brothers and sisters regarded as we. More importantly, hope reminds us that there is something prior to history and beyond socialization that's definitory of the human being. It is a project that is always already in progress, never complete, but forever moving forward. Our guest today, His Excellency, Ban Ki-moon ably guides the United Nations in pursuit of these and other lofty goals. It is an honor for Winthrop House, the Harvard Foundation, Harvard College, and Harvard University 
to welcome you here today. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you, Professor Sullivan. Well said. It is my privilege at this point to invite to the podium the Winthrop House Student Committee Chair, Matilda Monpetit. Matilda? Hello. Um, my name is Matilda Monpetit, and I currently serve as the co chair of the Winthrop House Committee. I am also completely floored by the fact that I'm standing here tonight, um, not just because when I was little, I think I thought that the Secretary General of the United Nations was the literal president of the world. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, though, the Secretary General has the unique ability to focus the whole world's attention on the issues that matter most. The, mil the Millennium Development Goals, which have roused countries towards meaningful change on behalf of their poor citizens, were established at under Secretary General Bond's predecessor. But today, the issues that face the UN, and by extension, the students that are honoring Secretary General Bond tonight, cannot be solved with benchmarks and quotas, but with meaningful activism on the part of doctors, politicians, artists, in short, everyone. There are issues, then, that concern every student here at Harvard. Secretary Bond's fights against Ebola for peace in the Middle East and especially close to my heart, for gender equality, um, are inspiring not only to students who hope to enter into diplomacy, but for anyone who cares about the future of this world. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Montpetit. It is my privilege at this time to introduce to this gathering tonight and to many students here for the first time, our Dean of Harvard College. Our Dean, a person of extraordinary erudition and scholarship, but also a person of great skills in leadership and an understanding with a great vision, the needs for Harvard College. A person who loves and cares about Harvard students a great deal, and a person for whom I have great admiration in terms of his vision for this college as an opportunity for a transformational education. It is my privilege to welcome to the podium the new Dean of Harvard College, Dean Rakesh Karana. Mr. Secretary General, Ms. Spahn, it is an honor to welcome you on behalf of Harvard College. Um, as Dr. Counter just said, um, it's also an opportunity for me to share with you the mission of Harvard College. The mission of Harvard College has been for almost 400 years now to educate the citizens and citizen leaders for our society. It is a mission we take very seriously. We helped educate some of the students who helped imagine this country and its aspirations. Students who led the anti-slavery movements, abolition movements. No institution other than West Point has given more lives in service of its nation. We've helped inspire students who've led the civil rights movements, women's rights, BGLTQ rights. And we do this through our belief in the transformative power of a liberal arts and sciences education, which begins for us with the intellectual transformation new ways of knowing, new ways of understanding, all toward the goal of developing an independent mind. And then, as Professor Sullivan alluded to, we do this in our belief by embedding this experience in a diverse living environment, where our students study alongside students who are different from them, who come from different walks of life, have different stories, different identities, which we believe not only deepens that intellectual transformation, but creates the conditions for a social transformation, out of which we begin that our students will hope to answer some questions for themselves of who am I and who do I want to be? How do I relate to others? And what can I learn from others? What are my gifts and talents and how can I best use them to serve the world? I think this is a particularly important message today that you're bringing to us. We're being asked by the world 
and ourselves about how do we strengthen our bonds as a community. Headlines in recent weeks continue to point to the challenges that we have, where diversity is often framed as a challenge. But you are at a place where we don't see diversity as a challenge, but rather the foundation of limitless possibilities. And our capacity to thrive in diversity is more critical now as a university than ever to our mission to serve the world. Because our ability, as we become more diverse, to produce new knowledge, harness the energies of our students and citizens, rests on whether we can bind ourselves together as one community. And we do this at a time when our world sometimes seems to be fragmenting into ever smaller subgroups in which too often it seems like tribalism conquers our common humanity, in which conceptions of identity often become retreats to comfort and an excuse not to engage, and an intolerance for deviation from ideological conformity. And at the same time, we've never lived in a world that's so small, so interdependent, so connected, when our connection and our common human destiny has never been more intertwined. Your example of what you're setting for us is an inspiration to us in our own community as we try to educate the citizens and citizen leaders for our society. And we are so thankful and grateful for your gift and presence here today. Thank you, Dean Karana. And our final tribute before we begin our meal is from a student from the Harvard Foundation who's given us outstanding leadership, Ms. Tiffany Ramos. Good evening, students, faculty, administrators, Mr. Secretary General, his family, and associates. My name is Tiffany Marie Ramos, and I'm a junior here at the college. As a third year foundation intern, I must say it is with great honor that I stand before you all tonight <clears throat> to honor Ban Ki-moon as our humanitarian of the year at the Harvard Foundation. From promoting sustainable development and climate change to coordinating the international fight against human trafficking and Ebola, Ban Ki-moon has been serving, empowering, and improving our world's community. His efforts have consistently been in line with the Harvard Foundation to improve relations amongst ethnic groups and racial groups on campus, though perhaps he does this on a slightly larger scale. <laughs> in response to the crisis in Libya, for example, Ban Ki-moon insisted that there is no space for violence and that concerns must be addressed through inclusive dialogue. Ban Ki-moon has also promoted LGBTQ rights <clears throat> recently condemning over 75 countries that still run on anti-gay laws. As Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon has also demonstrated his passion for empowering women, increasing the number of women in senior management positions to over 40%, the highest level in the organization's history. Ban Ki-moon has mobilized world leaders to engage in inclusive dialogue, to combat discrimination and injustice, and to empower the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. We at the Harvard Foundation are so humbled to have you with us this evening, Ban Ki-moon. Thank you for your incredible work in improving our international community. Thank you for your inspirational leadership and fervent concern for humanity. And lastly, and most of all, thank you for joining us here tonight as our Humanitarian of the Year. Thank you. Please enjoy your dinner, and we'll come back to you shortly with some additional remarks. Thank you. As we begin our program for the rest of the evening, I want to acknowledge that at the head table, we have our distinguished professor of oceanography and one of the faculty hosts for this event, member of the faculty council, Professor James J. McCarthy. Then, Professor McCarthy, will you stand, sir, and let's make sure we identify yourself? <laughs> Thank you. Also, we have at the head table, um, we have a, a person who will speak with you later, so I'll introduce him at that time. But I want to introduce you next to 
the faculty representative who spoke at the lecture this afternoon at the Memorial Church to represent our faculty, former Mather House Master, and now Dean of the Summer School and Head of Undergraduate Studies, Dr. Sandra Nadaf. Dr. Nadaf, will you stand, please? <laughs> Thank you very much. And there are others in the audience that I will uh, mention to you a little later in the program. But at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to our students someone that maybe many of you in your four years at Harvard will not have the opportunity to meet, and hopefully this will be an introduction tonight. Um, someone who is a Harvard College graduate and also a Harvard Law School graduate, but also a member of the Harvard Corporation, the body that guides Harvard and selects its officers, uh, its president, and other members of the corporation. And he's given us great leadership, and we're so pleased to have him here with us tonight to represent Harvard University. And he is a distinguished lawyer and one who also is very dedicated to Harvard College as well as to Harvard University. It is an honor to have with us tonight distinguished member of the Harvard Corporation, Mr. William F. Lee. Please. Thank you, Dr. Counter. Uh, on behalf of the Harvard Corporation, it is my honor to welcome you and join you this evening and to welcome Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and Mrs. Ban and to congratulate him for winning and receiving the Peter J. Gomes Humanitarian Award. As many of you know, we are not simply welcoming the Secretary General to Harvard. Rather, we are welcoming back one of the Kennedy School's most distinguished alumni. The Secretary General has previously observed that his years in Cambridge as a graduate student in the 1980s were a critical formative part of his career, one that set him on his remarkable path of diplomacy and success and peacekeeping. <laughs> Secretary General Bond's involvement with the humanitarian mission of the United Nations extends much further back, however. As a child born into occupied Korea before the end of World War II, he personally experienced in a deeply, in a deep way, the United Nations role in humanitarian relief and rebuilding efforts in helping his country rise, as he himself has so powerfully put it, and I quote, from the ashes of war. The Secretary General exemplifies the values of perseverance at these most difficult and challenging times. As a boy, he taught himself English through conversations with American soldiers and advisors who would throw chocolates and chewing gum to him and other children. As an 18-year-old in 1962, he won an English language contest sponsored by the American Red Cross. The program took the young Mr. Bond from his hometown on the Korean Peninsula to Washington, DC. But just before he departed, something very important happened. He met his wife of now more than 40 years, who was the student council president. <laughs> and she presented him with bamboo strainers before he left, the traditional symbol of luck for his long journey. When he arrived in Washington, there was another fortuitous meeting. This didn't result in a marriage. Um, <laughs> he met President Kennedy, and the Secretary General has attributed that unlikely chance meeting to the, that encounter uh, as a galvanizing moment in his life, one that charted his career and motivated him to appear, work, and succeed on the world stage. I think his presence here tonight, as Professor Sullivan said, is particularly important because this was President Kennedy's house 75 years ago. To welcome him here to President Kennedy's home for four, three years is fitting. Officially, the Secretary General began his career with the UN in 1975. His postings have ranged from India to Austria to his own country's home office. Today, it is safe to say he has frequently assigned himself to the most urgent and challenging crises and postings in the world. He is often the first diplomat to arrive at disaster-torn sites around the globe, signaling with his personal presence the world's united attention 
to humanity's most vulnerable populations. Earthquake wracked communities in Haiti and in Chile. Pakistan after the floods. Gaza ablaze with man-made calamities. And he was there personally in every circumstance. Over the course of his two terms, the Secretary General, Secretary General has met crisis after crisis with calm confidence and wise leadership. Around this time last year, the Secretary General launched the UN's Human Rights Upfront Initiative to create a claim. He has made a concentrated push to place and develop women leaders in the UN ranks. He has also led from the front on urgent issues such as climate change, building key bridges with government leaders and private sector investors. At the same time, he has faced the highest stakes imaginable in international diplomacy, particularly earlier this year when Syrian rebels took 45 peacekeeping troops hostage in the Golan Heights. The Secretary General's predecessor, Kofi Annan, another recipient of the Harvard Foundation Humanitarian Award, has called the Secretary General, and again I quote, a man with a truly global mind. And the Secretary General has worked to impart the importance of that mindset to your generation, you the students, who he would urge to become, all of you to become global citizens. He has said in interviews, he has said in the press, that the United Nations is what each new generation makes of itself. Secretary General Bond has made the UN a shining beacon a steady source of life, of light during some of humanity's most darkly shrouded moments. I have, ha I have the highest personal admiration for him, and I know that all of you will join me this evening in welcoming him, paying tribute to him as he continues on his noble mission. Your Excellency, welcome back to Harvard, and congratulations. Thank you, uh, Dr. William Lee, for your very kind introduction and welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> and Professor Ronald Sullivan, Housemaster, and Professor Rakesh Kunara, Kurana, a Dean of Harvard College. Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished faculty, it's a great pleasure again to meet you. This is my almost last of my schedule uh, in Boston. I have some other in the morning, hour, morning tomorrow morning. Uh, but while I'm you know, really uh, interested in speaking uh, much longer, then I'm afraid that uh, I have spoken a lot uh, during my acceptance speech. And I don't know how many, how many of you were there. So whatever I may say, whatever subject I may say, it may be some repetition for most of you. So my challenge, my problem is not now what to say after having spoken about half an hour covering almost all the world's problems <laughs> which we have. <laughs> then my wife, um, while coming here, I was asking to my wife, what should I, what should I Tell them, then why don't you say a joke? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time for me to say a few jokes. <laughs> I understand that each and every profession draws some cynical jokes. And now, there are not many favorable jokes for any profession. Lawyers may get some jokes about uh, Law, uh, jokes and uh, professors or politicians, particularly politicians. <laughs> I'm a diplomat, long time diplomat, uh, even diplomats uh, who should work for peace and uh, development, human rights, they also draw some cynical jokes about uh, being a diplomat. So let me tell you one thing. <laughs> a British uh, diplomat ambassador 
Ambassador, I wanted to visit Europe from England in a balloon. So he rode a balloon and balloon was flying into somewhere in a European country. But unfortunately, he forgot to, to bring his map. So he was not able to where to land. Now he was looking down the uh, earth. Then he found the one person you know, going somewhere. So he shouted, look, where am I now? And he said, you are there where you are now. Then what is the name of that mountain? He pointed at some mountain. That, that mountain's name is such and such. And what's the name of that the river there? That the river is called the such and such uh, a river. And then the farmer was going. So he's, he, he didn't uh, figure out where, uh, where he was uh, still. Then while he was flying just uh, less than a minute, then this farmer shouted back to him, by the way, are you a diplomat? <laughs> then he was very happy. Wow, this farmer recognized me as a distinguished diplomat. Well, by the way, how did you know that I am a diplomat? Then who else would ask such a silly question except a diplomat? <laughs> so despite this kind of uh, very silly, funny, and cynical jokes and <laughs> About the diplomat, I chose to be a diplomat. <laughs> but the before, before knowing that kind of a joke about diplomat, as uh, Dr. Lee introduced me, uh, in 1962, I had an extraordinary, unique um, privilege and honor of meeting President John F. Kennedy at the time in the, at the White House. I was one of about 100 uh, students coming from oh, about 40 some countries. I was representing my country. Uh, I don't remember all what he said. At that time, what he was saying is that, look, uh, because 1962 was in the middle of Cold War and people were not talking, countries were divided into two camps. He said, look, some countries are not getting along well. But you young, young people, you are different. And people are talking. People are talking. So I hope uh, you will try to talk among different, different countries. And he said a very, very important uh, <clears throat> word saying that this is uh, related to my to my uh, award today, is that it's now, even though the world is not talking each other, but there are some areas where you can do. It's a matter of uh, whether you are ready to provide your helping hands to many people around the world. That was quite striking, even though I was uh, just a young man without having any global vision. Uh, he was uh, talking about the importance of um, helping people who were in need of help from others. I decided at that time uh, to become a diplomat. At that time, my vision was that I need to do something good for my country. There's a war-torn country. Korea was so poor, devastated by war. So I thought that somehow, by becoming a diplomat, I could do something for my country. And that's why I started my Korean diplomatic career. After having served uh, more than 35, 36 years, my vision has been widening at, to outside world. Isn't there, wouldn't there be anything which I could do for some broader world, broader world? That's why I applied for this job as a Secretary General. Now, what I'm doing as a Secretary General of the United Nations, of course, uh, under the United Nations Charter, I have to talk about the peace and security of the world, and I have to protect the human rights of people whose human dignity are abused and violated. 
And I have to help many countries, particularly developing countries, who has to develop their own country. That's a development. Now, we are, I, I've been doing all these uh, three pillar uh, related issues. Among them, you will be surprised to know that uh, there are many things uh, which United Nations is doing. We are providing just the daily food to minimum 100 million people a day. 100 million people a day. This includes 51 million refugees who fled their own countries to other countries. Those countries where they sought refuge are not the well-to-do countries. They are not Europeans or they are not Americans. They are mostly developing countries. Then it is only the United Nations who has to mobilize all this daily food, water, sanitation, education. Recently, during the last three years, more than 3.3 3 million, 3 .3 million refugees have become new refugees because of Syrian uh, crisis, uh, tragedies. There are about 10 million Syrian people who have become internally displaced. They had to leave their hometowns and leave somewhere as a displaced persons. Those are all the people for whom United Nations have to work. It requires a lot of uh, commitment and political will, but it requires helping hands, helping hands. United States is the single largest donor country, most uh, generous, most humanitarian uh, country in the world. But of course, uh, there are many other countries who are helping these, uh, these refugees and people who are sick. And it's not only refugees. There are many sick people who really need our helping hands. There are many people who are dying from preventable diseases. In this world of 21st century, when particular countries in the United, Nation, United States, most of the people, the, I think 100, maybe 99 out of 100 women will survive in their delivery of babies. Like uh, women in Sweden, they will most probably all survive. For women in South Sudan or Congo, I think mostly, I think three, four out of 10 will die, will never be able to leave, and will never be able to see their children. So all these are very tragic, uh, tragic uh, situation. That's why my mother, my mother, <clears throat> you know, I was born without any help, or, you know, I was born just in my home, my mother used to tell me that uh, at that time, when a woman was laboring, delivering a baby, they would just stare at the rubber shoes on the doormat. Why they were staring their shoes? Because they were not sure whether they will be able to wear their shoes again after delivering a baby. Baby and mother. They all died in most of the cases. This world has to change. The United Nations has been really trying to uh, prevent this, uh, change this kind of situation. That's what I have been uh, doing, of course, with the help of many countries around the world, including the United States. In that regard, I'm very much honored. At the same time, I feel a sort of some sense of guiltiness. The, is it the right that I received this award of uh, humanitarian of the year from Harvard Foundation? I'm the right, the only person. That's why I mentioned about uh, my Under Secretary General, top humanitarian coordinator, uh, Baroness uh, Valerie Amos, because she has been handling traveling all around the world, mobilizing money. Of course, you know, I have also been uh, trying to mobilize money. I've been speaking to President Obama. Please 
help us, or all the prime ministers and president around the world, or oil rich countries. That's what we've been doing. We will have to continue, even though we are troubled by uh, many crises in the world. It's not only uh, Syria. There are many refugees and people in South Sudan, Congo, Libya, uh, <coughs> Sudan, again, Sudan and South Sudan, Iraq. I have been traveling many refugee camps, refugee camps, and I have been visiting many hospitals, health clinics, or health posts where poor people are just lying almost dead there. I'm asking Harvard community uh, to do even much more. You have uh, the best and the brightest scholars in the science and health issues, not to mention all these uh, liberal arts and sciences, but when you have to help people, there are clearly many ways that academic institutions, particularly this highest learning academic instit institutions can help the uh, United Nations. That's why uh, this evening, when I was meeting <coughs> uh, President Faust, I <coughs> suggested her if uh, <coughs> Harvard University can join uh, United Nations Academic Impact. Uh, this is an initiative which I launched four years ago. Uh, because I thought that <coughs> in working for the world. It's not the United Nations. It's not the United States alone. Nobody can do it alone. However powerful, however resourceful United, Nations, uh, United States may be, you cannot do it alone. United Nations cannot do it alone. Everybody should have hands on deck. That's why I launched Academic Impact. I have already launched an initiative with the business community. It's called UN Global Compact. About 8,000 companies are joining and trying to uh, some help as a partnership. I thought that this um, higher learning academic institutions can also help. Uh, first of all, your responsibility is to produce a good, student, good students with the global visions, global visions. But your learning, your knowledge, and your research results can help United Nations work very much. And I'm encouraged that President Faust is, that she would favorably consider if I provide some more detailed information. And that's what uh, I'm asking you uh, today as a Harvard uh, community, if you do more beyond your teaching, beyond your learning. If you can, your learning, your knowledge can be used for global goods, global common goods for humanity. This is my message today, and I'm very pleased to see more students than professors this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, whenever Wherever I go, it's normally government, senior government officials, or like uh, professors. But this particular event, I see more students who would be our leaders. And you have uh, heavy responsibilities, and I'll do my best, and your professors will do their best, I believe, to do their own role today. But when, as your time comes, I think you should be ready to take charge of this world. We have still a lot of things to do. And be a global citizen. Just to forget about uh, where you are coming from. This world is a very small world. It's a tightly connected world. Just one email or one your Twitter can reach the end of this planet Earth within a blink of eye blink, you know, just a fraction of a second. So this world in that regard is just one world, a small world. We are just one global family 
then our vision should be that we must be a global citizen working for global peace, development, and human rights. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for your eloquent remarks. As we close our program, I would like to introduce to you, before the final gift is delivered, um, a gentleman who has served Harvard for over 40 years as an admissions officer. And we like to remind this community that he started at Harvard when Harvard did not appear and was not as diverse as it is today. And he was most instrumental, along with the other members of the staff of the Harvard Admissions Office, most instrumental in bringing about the diversity in Harvard College students that we can appreciate today. He is the Senior Admissions Officer of Harvard College, Mr. David L. Evans. Thank you, Dr. Counter, and thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for honoring us with your presence today. I was told that I should speak uh, three or four minutes, and I responded by saying I'm from rural Arkansas, and I can't clear my throat in three or four minutes. So. <laughs> As uh, Dr. Counter said, I have been here more than 40 years. In fact, I've helped to choose 46 classes. Now, all of those of you who were admitted, I broke the tie vote. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and all of those who didn't make it, when you encounter them, say that Mr. Evans was absent that day. <laughs> when I came to work here, uh, this kind of assembly could not happen. In fact, uh, if we were thinking of it as a condiment table, it would have been mostly salt with a very small shake of black pepper. <laughs> Today, however, as we look out, it is salt, pepper of many flavors, cinnamon, saffron, and fascinating combinations there are. <laughs> Reminds me of the United Nations. <laughs> In those years, we have seen alumni go out to, to do great things. High, high positions in government and teaching for America and diplomacy, etc. So you have some challenges, students. And as I think of that, I was thinking of something that I saw on a morning television show when the Secretary General was being interviewed. And he said something like this, and forgive me if I misquote you, he said, normally in planning, you have a strategic plan A and plan B, but we do not have a planet B. And this was regarding your combating the deterioration of our environment. We do not have a planet B. The other thing that impressed me greatly was your efforts to combat Ebola. And when I saw some of those pictures coming back from Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea, I thought very deeply of some of your words. And I thought, I said, now, the word life has more letters in it than years of life that Ebola has permitted many of these young children to live. That's shameful. We should do something about it. You have the creativity. You have the resourcefulness. And I'm sure you have the inspiration. When you say that's impossible, think about what the Allies faced when they were trying to break the Enigma Code of the Germans. I remember seeing one of the strategists and in intelligence in Britain was telling Alan Turing, the chance of you breaking that is a million, a million million to one. That can't be done. Well, it was done. And you have in your cell phone millions times more computer technology 
than the Allies had. Yet they broke the Enigma Code. They broke the Japanese Code. They won, won World War II. So you will be held accountable. So all of these problems that you have, I won't be around 46 years from now, maybe 45, but not more than that. <laughs> but we will hope that you will have tackled some of them, done something about it. When you look at things like Trayvon Martin's uh, life cut too short, Michael Brown's life cut too short, victims of Ebola, they look like other. They look distant from you. And it reminds me of something I heard in Sunday school back in rural Arkansas, and I'm going to leave you with that. It said, as I approached the mountain, I thought I perceived a monster. But as I came close, I saw that it was not a monster, but a man. And as I came even closer, I saw that he was my brother. I sought my God, and my God eluded me. I sought my friend, and my friend forsook me. I sought them together and found all three. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Evans. And finally, we have from the Harvard Foundation Student Advisory Committee a gift to be presented to His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. It's going to be presented by Ms. Gamani Kabur. Want to come around, Ms. Carr? You, you may come behind the table if you like, yes, so that he won't have to come out. Yeah, if you want to come around, whatever you like, OK? <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Carr, very much. Well, as we close the evening, um, I know that I will not be able to name and thank everyone that I need to tonight, but I do want to acknowledge a few uh, others here uh, who have been very helpful in this entire program and in other ways. First, I'd like to welcome um, Mr. Uh, Zhao Li Ming, Dr. Zhao Li Ming, who is our Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Statistics, Dr. Zhao Li Ming, yes indeed. Uh, I think uh, if we could take, okay, well wait a second, let me get the photo, thank you. Okay. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, someone who is very special to many of us, she was the first woman to become chair of a medical school a department, the Department of Neurology. And when you walk into the Massachusetts General Hospital, you'll see her portrait on the wall as one of the pioneers in medicine. She led the way in the discovery of the mechanisms that create Huntington disease and lived among the people of uh, Venezuela who suffered tragically uh, in some areas from this disease, and Dr. Ann B. Young. Dr. Young, will you stand, please? Thank you. Also, I'd like to introduce a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School who currently serves as a diplomat and still teaching at Harvard. Uh, he is uh, Mr. Leonard Kopelman, who is from Leverett House, but here he is tonight in Winthrop House. Mr. Kopelman, <laughs> Consul General of Finland. Consul General of Finland. Also, I'd like to introduce, sitting next to him, I see the Vice Consul of Sweden, and that is Ms. Gingo Olsen. Gingo, will you stand, please? <laughs> Many of you have seen the portraits around Harvard of the various people who have served Harvard for many years with distinction. Up until a few years back, almost all of Harvard's portraits were those of distinguished and honorable white males who should have portraits at Harvard. 
But I went to the president and said that in that little space between those portraits, in that large panoply of 3,000, couldn't we include some distinguished members of the Harvard community of color who've given us great service? And the president approved of that and leading that charge, he's already conducted 15 portraits of people such as Dr. Roulan Pion, who was the first Asian American housemaster at Cabot House, to Kio Maramoto, who served Harvard for many years. He was a World War II veteran with great distinction, to many others, Dr. Chet Pierce, who was uh, on the football team uh, with uh, uh, Kennedy, with Robert Kennedy from this house. He's done many others, 15 of them to be exact, and most recently, Caleb Chia Shakmuktuk, who was the first Native American graduate of Harvard College in 1665. We created an imagery by studying his tribe, and now you see it in the freshman union. He's Mr. Steve Coy. Thank you, Steve. Also near him is a historian graduate in mathematics of Harvard College and a PhD in the history of science. He's also on our portraiture committee giving us historical information and he is presently a professor at MIT. And that's Professor Kenneth Manning. With Dr. Manning, will you stand? The man who takes care of our lives and keeps us healthy, I see he is here. He's the head of the Harvard University Health Services, Dr. Paul Barrera. Please stand, Paul. <laughs> also from the Massachusetts General Hospital, we have tonight a former Harvard College student uh, who left Harvard College to go to medical school, and he's now a professor, and he's on the staff of the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Theodore Hong, are you here? Dr. Hong, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm sure I've forgotten somebody. And once I get back, they'll remind me of that. But thank you all so much for joining us. I'd like to thank the staff of the United Nations for taking part in this. Will the staff stand, please, for making this possible? You've all been, Ms. Kushinota, who was very helpful. All of the staff of the United Nations. <laughs> thank you so much. Do you have listening one? All right, thank you again for being our host, the Masters of uh, Winthrop House. Thank you, Dean Carana, for being our host. We appreciate everything. And Mr. Secretary General, most of all, thank you and Mrs. Bond for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.